good? Cool. Do you appreciate a worship team that will step in when the leader's sick and just do this thing? Thank you, Lord. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you are your just, you're the righteous judge, you're holy, you're true. Most high God, you give us everything we have in this life. You hold all power in your hands. You are the one from whom every blessing and good thing in this life comes. You are the one who heals our souls. Thank you, Jesus. And now we commit this time to you, and we ask you to touch our brother Alan and raise him up. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Cool. You guys know what I want up there before I do. <laughs> he heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. Good morning. My name is Dave, and just in case you don't know, I'm one of the elders here. I have a privilege to serve as an elder. And from time to time, they let me speak to the congregation. We all wonder about the wisdom of the leadership, but thank you for the opportunity. When I started praying and thinking and praying about what to talk about this morning, this topic, this subject, kept coming to mind, and to tell you the truth, I'm a little nervous about what I'm going to talk to you about today, because I'm going to talk to you about healing. And it turns out I have warts, literally. It turns out that they're caused by a virus infection, but I want to talk to you about healing. There's so many opinions and just plain false ideas about can I, do I click this or do you? I, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll try. And then when I get overwhelmed by the technology, you can step in. Technology is our friend, but not always. There are so many opinions and just plain false ideas about healing that it's hard to, uh, hard to know where to stop. You should be able to just tap the screen and you should go to the next one automatically. Okay. That's the one. Do I have warts because I sinned? <laughs> Maybe it was my parents. No, they literally are an infection. Um, if I'm sick and I'm not healed immediately, does that mean I don't have enough faith? Does it mean that my friends don't have enough faith? Or that I should just accept the sovereignty of God and live with this illness? Or maybe healing is not really for today? It was some other time? Um, <clears throat> Okay, we'll get to that. No, we won't. This is... Um, I'm sorry, are there a bunch of slides with Alliance logos on them? Yes. You know what, we're gonna just feel our way through this. That's the one, thanks. I grew up in the Christian and Missionary Alliance and we, we preach, we emphasize the fourfold gospel. Jesus is our savior, our sanctifier, our healer, our coming king. And in fact, that logo on the screen and on the wall represents this fourfold gospel. The cross represents the salvation that comes to us through the death of Jesus. It reminds us that Jesus' death saves us and it removes, he removes our sin. He brings us into a right relationship with God, our Father, 
if we just trust him. The figure that looks like an oversized wine glass is really a laver. It's not a wine glass. A laver was an old kind of a basin that the Old Testament priests would use to wash in to symbolize purity when they came before God. And Jesus is our priest who is pure himself and who makes us pure, holy, acceptable before God. Jesus saves us and he sanctifies us. And on the left, the pitcher. The pitcher represents the pitcher of oil that we use to anoint people when we pray for healing for them. And of course, the, the crown. The crown represents Jesus coming. He, he is coming. He will establish his earthly kingdom physically here on this earth. And I was, I was raised, I was steeped in this alliance teaching as a boy. Jesus is our healer. And then my boyhood pastor, Harold Hill, very godly man, slowly lost his eyesight and had to leave the ministry. And so the question I'm struggling with is, how do we reconcile our experience, what we live with, with what the, the infallible, inspired Word of God tells us? If God's Word is true, we have to be able to experience it. So what's, what is the point here? There are three things I want you to take away this morning, if you can remember. Jesus is our healer. We are, how did I put this? There's no concise, pithy way to put this sentence. Each of us is a single, unified individual with interconnected parts. We want to compartmentalize, but we're, we have lots of parts, but they all fit together. They all are interconnected. And we put our faith, our faith is in a good God, a good, good God who always According to his character, he always does good. So Jesus is our healer. And I know there's a slide that starts with that and has a verse on it. In the back where you came in, there were sheets of paper with list, a list of verses that proclaim Jesus is the healing God. They, these verses span the Old Testament and the New Testament they tell us that the Lord God is our healer. And when, when Sue and I were young in our marriage, she was diagnosed with a tumor. Surgery was scheduled. They, she went into the operating room. They opened her body, and there was no sign of a tumor. We prayed. Lots of people prayed. And God healed her. Healing is very real today. Jesus spent a whole lot of time when he was physically present on the earth healing people. He demonstrated that he cared about their physical well-being. Um, yeah, he demonstrated he cared about their physical well-being, and he did something about it. He healed people. He even healed somebody like the man in John chapter 5 who did not ask him for healing. Jesus went to him at the pool of Bethesda and he said, do you want to be healed? And the man had an excuse, but Jesus healed him. Um, actually, any time that we receive something from God, any time that God does anything for us, he has initiated that contact. He comes to us. He blesses us. He brings us to the next stage of our faith. He comes to us and asks, do you want this? And we have to respond in a level of faith, which we know comes from him, but we have to respond and ask him for what he will do. Also, um, Jesus rose out of the grave with new resurrection life that life he offers to you and to me. He offers us resurrection life, and we, spiritual beings who live in this physical body, carry about with us the life of Jesus. 
Uh, St. Paul told us about this in, in Corinthians. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. And then just before that, in the previous chapter, he said, we are always carrying around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. That's, I'm not really qualified to explore that theologically. That's some heavy stuff there. But I can read what it says. It says, when Jesus died, you experienced that death if you come to faith in him. And when Jesus is resurrected, his life is in you. You carry the life of Jesus in your physical body. That's pretty cool. You carry the life of Jesus in your body. On the other hand, we all remember people, faithful believers, who um, accepted medical care, who prayed for healing, and nevertheless, they succumbed to illness and they passed on. Where does sickness come from? Why don't we always experience healing? Okay, just a theological point. Sickness always comes from sin, but not necessarily the sin of the person that's sick. If you're sick, that does not mean you sinned. When Adam and Eve sinned a long time ago, this world was broken, and we are broken people living in a broken world, and God doesn't always shield us from the brokenness around us. So sickness is in the world because sin is in the world. Sickness enters your body because you were breathing when somebody coughed. Okay? It's not necessarily about sin. There are a number of reasons we may not experience full healing before we stand face to face before Jesus in glory. Um, I just mentioned we are broken people. We live in a broken world. Um, it might just be a direct attack of Satan, a test of your faith, a trial. It might simply be the result of living in this world that, as a whole, is in rebellion against God. Honestly, we may be ill as a result of some of our own foolish, not necessarily obviously evil, our own foolish choices. Um, I know you're too polite to notice, but I'm overweight and pre-diabetic and struggling to lose weight. Why doesn't God do something about that? Because he let me choose to enjoy food, and I chose to enjoy food too much and to enjoy too much of it. And I didn't exercise discipline. And now I need to exercise some discipline. Sometimes it's our own choice. It's not that it's evil to have another corn chip, but it may not be the best thing you could do. Um, for me, this is a shortcoming. It's a failing. For me, it's a sin. I'm not saying anything about you or your weight or your metabolism. I'm talking about myself here. Um, so there are a lot of reasons you might be sick. They're not all symptoms of some sin. In fact, at one point, Jesus saw a man, Jesus and his disciples, saw a man at a pool who was very ill. He'd been, Ill. He'd been lame since birth, and his disciples wanted a little theological confirmation for themselves, and they said, well, who sinned? Was it him or was it his parents? Why is he this way? And Jesus answered what you see up there. Jesus answered, it is not this man that's, it is not that this man sinned, or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. That might be a little bit hard to accept. This man lived, I think, 38 years, lame, so that God could demonstrate his glory. Not all sickness is a result of our sin or the sin of somebody close to us. It's true, when we are sick, or any time at all in this life, it's a good idea to examine ourselves, to ask ourselves if we have somehow chosen our own way instead of God's way. It's a good idea to recognize that sin, sin in its essence is me choosing my way. 
deciding that I know better than God what I should do, what I can enjoy, what would be fun today. But that is not always the cause of sin. It's just a good idea to examine ourselves. Uh, and when God does allow us to reap the effects of the seeds we have sown, the many sesame seeds on the hamburger buns, we reap the fruit. And, um, yeah, you can see the results. But our first assignment when we're facing this life is self-examination and faith in Jesus. Then what about doctors? I mean, Jesus went around touching people and they were healed. So why would we bother with doctors? I'm, I'm sure you've heard of, probably known people who refused medical attention because God will just heal me directly. Um, it's tempting to spend a lot of time on this, and I'm not going to. Allow me to just point out that the prophet Jeremiah wrote, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the wound of the, uh, the health of the daughter of my people not been restored? Now, I know in this context, Jeremiah is talking about spiritual illness. He's talking about even spiritual adultery. But nonetheless, the literal meaning of those words implies there are physical physicians who deal with physical illness. And God is not condemning doctors. He's saying, where are the doctors? The doctors won't help you with your spiritual illness. They might help you with your headache. In fact, Jesus inspired Luke, who was a doctor, a physician, to write one of the Gospels. So I don't think Jesus, I don't think God condemns accepting the, health of, the help of doctors. I want to move on to each of us is a single unified individual with interconnected parts. If one of you can come up with a pithy way to say that, you can tell me after the service because this is an, I think this is an important point. In our life, in our world, we like to compartmentalize things. This is my spiritual life. This is my physical life. This is the way I act in church. This is the way I act at work. And it's quite a lot different when I'm driving on Interstate 84. And I know you know what I mean. We are each single unified beings. We, have, we are spirits. We live in physical bodies. We have a soul. We experience emotions. We experience joy and pain and love and beauty. But we're one person. Each one of us is one person. Um, and we are all interconnected with, with ourselves. My emotional state influences my physical well-being. I'm sure you know somebody who is so stressed out they make themselves sick. My physical health influences my emotional being. What I mean is when I'm sick, I get grumpy. And there's a connection with my spiritual life too. If I sin in my mind, in my physical body, that's a barrier between me and my God. Now, I'm not saying you're going to lose your salvation. That's, that is a whole different discussion. What I'm saying is that if we practice a life of sin, we're, putting, we're separating ourselves from God. And that has an effect on our life. So we are all, each one of us, is a single, unified being. And we're interconnected within ourselves. Um, I believe that's an important point because we want the blessings of, of the life in Jesus without undergoing the surgery of, of cutting off every single vestige of the old cancerous self-life. I just have a tendency to do this. It's okay. God understands. God does understand, by the way. This includes giving up the pain from the hurt of things that have happened to us maybe a long time ago in the past. Part of recognizing the Lordship of Jesus is saying, I want you to take care of this thing. I can't do it. It may be that the 
the Lord God will direct you to a counselor, a psychiatrist. It may be that God will direct, will interact with you directly and bring you to a place of healing. But somehow we have to give up those things that we hang on to because they're somehow our badge. Do you know what happened to me? And I know that's really hard. I've, I've done this. There are things I want to hang on to. And I'm not going to tell you about them because I want them to be gone. <laughs> um, it, it's a common truism today that you can't be helped until you know there's something wrong. And I, I know, I, I am fully convinced that with the, the simplest word, with the lightest touch, Jesus can heal us completely in an instant. In fact, there was a woman who had been, who'd had an affliction for years, and she said, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made well. And she did, and Jesus knew that somebody touched him, and he looked around and he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed of your disease. And she was well. Jesus can do that. But if we're honest, we have to admit that's not usually the way he works. Usually Jesus works with our whole person and he brings us to maturity, to completeness, one step at a time. And that can include our physical well-being because we are all one person. Um, it, it can take a rather lengthy process of coming to terms with who I am what my proclivities are, how much I need Jesus, and becoming slowly, maybe excruciatingly, willing to give up that old thing that I'm hanging on to. And I don't know how much your past hurts are influencing your physical health. I do know Jesus is Lord. And as we learn to follow him, he will bring us to the next step of maturity and complete health. But I want to hold on to these things. And you know, you and I have to just die. We have to come to the place where we know absolutely the only way we can have a, a good life, a fulfilled life, the life we were desi designed to have, the only way is if we give up our own and accept from Jesus. We come to death and we, we accept him. Um, Paul told us, I'm sorry, Jesus told us this. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat, that's me, falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. What's that part of my life that I just can't quite give up? That's where Jesus is trying to meet me, where Jesus wants to meet me. And this connects closely to the topic of healing, even though that's about sanctification. It talks about healing because my physical life, my emotional state, and my spiritual life are all intertwined, interconnected. And I move forward or backward one step at a time all together. And I know I'm a mess and I need Jesus to bring me to the next step, to continue to work within me, to, to bring me to complete maturity and health. I know this smacks of blaming the victim what, you, you think I don't have enough faith? I'm sick because I don't believe? I'm sick because I haven't accepted God's will and he is sovereign? That's not what I'm implying at all. I'm saying that for you, if you've chosen to love God, this will work for good. All things work for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose guess what? You are called according to his purpose. If you will accept this, 
you'll place your faith in Jesus, it, he will not keep away all the trouble that you face in the world. He said directly, in this world you have trouble, but I overcame the world. He will bring you step by step through that. Spiritual battle, physical illness, emotional trouble. And he will provide the resources you need. So, that my intent is not to blame you. My intent is to say, you are a whole person. And God knows better than you, God knows better than I, what the next step is. My part is just to say, okay, I trust you. Tell me what I'm supposed to do next, because I don't know. One of the verses our pastor is fond of quoting is one of the Old Testament kings said in prayer, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That's how we get through this life successfully. I am saying that God is at work in you for good. Both the process and the end goal have to be kept in mind. And God loves you way too much to let you be satisfied with just a feel-good, happy, happy salvation. He will bring you step by step to full fulfillment, to maturity. He will deal with the root causes of your pain. And those pauses, those causes might include some of your own choices. They might also include some really bad things that have happened to you. And it can be very difficult to deal with them. It might be in the family where you grew up. It might be in your current relationships or at work. But God is at work within you to bring it to good. And finally, I am coming, I'm going to bring this into a landing this morning. Our faith is in a very good God who always, true to his character, does good. We can trust him because he is a good, good God. He's always at work for our good. Remember that. We serve a good God. He will always act in keeping with his character. He will always do what is best for us in this particular circumstance, whatever the circumstance is, whatever this particular stage of life is, he will do what is good for us. And you can count on that. Um, I recently read an article by John Stumble about him, by him and about himself. He is currently the president of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, the denomination to which we belong. When he was a pastor in a local church, he, said he had what he called a serious health crisis, and he never received a clear, definitive diagnosis. People, probably well-meaning people, said to him, if he just had enough faith, he would be healed. And other people, who probably also meant well, implied God is sovereign, just accept your situation, this is the path God has chosen for you to walk. And both pieces of advice, is, advice kind of condemn the sick person. You just need to accept this, or you need to work up some faith, do faith exercises until you have enough faith to be healed. We do know that faith is required for the Christian life. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We also know that God is good, that he is working within us. And nothing is beyond his ability to redeem. Um, he doesn't necessarily approve of everything that happens in this world, clearly. He doesn't necessarily approve of everything that happens to you, but he can redeem it. Nothing is beyond his reach to redeem. So, <clears throat> so where am I? This life of faith requires a deep conviction, a deep conviction about who God is, even when he doesn't do what we want him to do, even when our circumstances are not changing, even when our life stinks. We have to come to the conclusion that God is 
who he says he is. That's what faith is about. We must not reduce our faith to, to just when God does what we want him to do. That's called manipulation, and God doesn't put up with that. Um, you remember Hebrews chapter 11, that list of the heroes of faith? Abraham and the people who were sawn in two, and lots and lots of people listed there. Do you remember the verse at the end of that chapter? And all these, though connect, commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. So what good was the promise? Well, the promise, the promise of these good things is fulfilled for them now in glory. They are with Jesus and they have received what they were promised. Um, <clears throat> They have received what they promise. John Stumble pointed out that we may have some big surprises when we deal with a condition that we would not have chosen. One can be the realization that grappling with God when we don't feel good, when he doesn't seem to be doing what he promises he will do, that is a fundamental form of faith. It's when I'm saying to God, I don't get this, I don't understand but I'm going to talk to you about it. And that faith is good for our, our growth. Another surprise might be being, um, being welcomed more fully into God's heart. We, you could probably give me a big list of God's ap attributes. He is love. He is all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He um, He's immutable. He's merciful. He's just. He's sovereign. And on and on and on. Underlying all of these attributes, these properties, he is good. God is a good God, and we get welcomed into his heart. So we don't have to like the stage of the journey that we're on. In fact, I know many of our brothers and sisters are, are being persecuted. They're suffering, and I'm sure they don't like that stage of their journey. But we can know. Even if our society crashes down, even if we have to sleep under a bridge, God is good, and he will bring us through this thing. So, I want you to remember this. Your illness might be an opportunity for you to grow in your faith. It might be an opportunity to demonstrate faith, faith in the face of difficulty. It might be an opportunity for you to become a little more like Jesus. It might be a way that you come to experience more fully the, the goodness of God, the character of the God you believe in. God will work for his glory and for your good in every situation. Jesus is our healer. Each of us is a single unified collection of things that don't seem to fit together but we are one each of us one person our faith is in a very good God who always true to his character does what is good Jesus is our healer if you place your faith in him he will bring you healing like those heroes in Hebrews 11, you may have to wait till you stand face to face with Jesus in, in glory and receive healing. You might have to go through some deep waters, a painful experience, many painful experiences. Or he may choose to heal you this morning. We need to, we need to both accept and press on and Realize that Jesus is our healer. He will bring us to healing. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, you, are, you, Lord, are full of mercy and grace. Forgive us for our difficulty believing. It's in you that all healing is performed. You are the miracle worker. 
In your spirit, healing is still alive. In you, Lord, we can put our trust. You can heal us. You can protect us from death and from the enemies of our soul. You are the miracle worker for us, for the sick, for the lost souls. You forgive us. You save us from condemnation. You cleanse us. You make us born again. And you give us life and health, clean hearts and peace. Life and health are in your hands. Help us to put our trust in you. You are our medicine. You know our thoughts, our sighings, our cryings, the hair on our head. You are wonderful, and you make all good things come. Heal us, Lord. Your will be done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.